During all the festivities, traditions, and activities that surround this time of year, it can be easy to desensitize ourselves to the true meaning and reason for the season. Discover how we can recapture the relevance of the season as you watch Turning Point today. Here is your host, Dr. David Jeremiah. In America, at least everybody has a response to Christmas. It's absolutely too pervasive and culturally important to ignore. For some, it's a time to party. For others, a time to take days off from work. For others, a time to shop the sales. And yes, for some, it's a time to worship Jesus Christ and celebrate His birth. How did so many irrelevant reasons for the season become a part of Christmas? And what should our reason for the season be? Well, today's message, Why Christmas Demands a Response, will answer those questions by noting four responses of those who celebrated the very first Christmas. In doing so, we'll discover the appropriate way to respond and celebrate the birth of our Lord today. Welcome to this very special Christmas edition of Turning Point. It is amazing to me that if we just go back and read the story of the first Christmas, if we just study the narratives of what the Bible has given to us to help us understand what really happened then, we can recover a sense of involvement with this season that will carry us through and help us to look back and say, you know what, that was the best Christmas I ever had. For that year, I celebrated Christmas with Jesus Christ at the center of the celebration. Now it begins, if you will, with the story of those who participated in the incarnation. And if it's all right with you, I'd like to start kind of backwards and move toward the center. The last to arrive who, who worshiped the Lord Jesus were the wise men, as you know. And the record of their participation in the first Christmas story is found in Matthew's gospel and the second chapter. And there in the first few verses, we read these words. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now we always celebrate Christmas with the Magi, with the wise men. And we do not know exactly when the wise men came to worship Jesus, but one thing we do know, it was much later than it is more often portrayed in Christmas pageants today. Let me be certain with you about this. The wise men were not at the manger where Joseph and Mary and the shepherds were. There are a couple of instances in the passage that we have read that help us understand that. First of all, if you'll look back in your Bible at verse 11, you'll discover that when the wise men came uh, to worship Jesus, they came to a house. Joseph and Mary and the shepherds were never together in a house. They were in a shed or a barn 
because you remember there was no room for them in the inn, and so they were relegated to the shed outside the inn that belonged to cattle. When we read in verse 11 that the wise men came to a house, we know this was a different occasion, a different time. Secondly, in two places in this passage we have just read, we are told that the wise men came to worship Jesus and he was a young child. Now, in the language of the New Testament, there are two different words that are used to describe Jesus. One of the words that describes him in Luke is a word that describes a little baby, a baby in arms. But the word young child in the language of the New Testament describes someone much older than that, and we believe perhaps as old as two years old. So the wise men came to worship Jesus, not in coincidence with the shepherds, but they came at a much later time. And they came to worship Jesus when he was a young child. Now it's interesting that it took several miracles to get the wise men to the place where Jesus was. The Bible tells us they followed a star. And if you have been reading uh, the news magazines over the last several Christmases, you know that our secular friends love to deal with this and talk about how impossible this was scientifically for this to have happened. The star had been seen in the east, and it now appeared to the wise men in such a specific way that it directed them to the very house where Jesus was staying. Bethlehem is five miles south of Jerusalem. Stars travel from the east to the west, not from the north to the south. It is very probable that the star that these men saw that was, was carrying them along to the place where Jesus was and was hovering over the house where Jesus was staying was none other than the Shekinah glory of God himself, perhaps even the very same glory that led the children of Israel for 40 years during the wilderness. I want to just pause and say that if Almighty God can bring his son into the world without a father through a virgin, don't worry about the star. <laughs> the star's okay. He can do whatever he wants, and if he wanted to create a special star for that particular moment, he's God. And the Bible says nothing is too hard for him. I always smile when these people debate these various things to try to unravel the story of Christmas. And isn't it interesting that when the wise men finally came to the house where Jesus was with his parents, they brought gifts. This is the celebration of the birthday of Jesus. And it is often true that when we celebrate his birthday, he is the only one who doesn't get a gift. Now suppose this is your birthday and all of your friends come and you're seated at the table after the birthday cake and it's time for you to receive your gifts, but instead of receiving gifts, everybody passes gifts out to each other and you don't get one. What kind of a birthday is that? Not one I want to participate in, I'll tell you that for sure. Try that on your kids, right? <laughs> I don't make lightly of it when I say that one of the things that happens often to us at this season of the year is we get so caught up giving gifts to others that we forget it's the birthday of the Lord Jesus himself. The wise men came to worship the newborn Savior, and they brought gifts. Perhaps that's what started all of this that we celebrate at this season, the wise men giving gifts to Jesus, now all of us celebrating the season by giving gifts to one another. So I'd like to suggest to all of us here this morning that we can respond to Christmas through the sacrifice of obedience and the obedience of sacrifice. Few of us here have riches like these men had, but all of us are abundantly blessed with resources that we can offer to God. What matters most is that we honor God with the gifts that we do have. We can sing his praises. We can share the gospel. We can serve the needy. These gifts are just as valuable as those of the wise men when they come from a heart of love and they are just as precious in the sight of God. And who among us would not say that the greatest joy we've ever had was making Christmas special for someone we might not even have known because we were giving in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says, if we give to one of the least of these, my brethren, said the Lord, we have given unto him as we have given to those during the season, the Bible says we have literally given to him by giving to them. 
and we reflect the heart of God and the heart of Jesus. One last thought about the wise men. They gave their time. The journey probably took about two years from where they first began to when they found the Lord Jesus. They gave their time and they gave their talent. They were wise men and it was obvious that they used their wisdom to discern the nature of this whole situation. Even Herod recognized it, their giftedness. So they gave their time and they gave their talent and when they showed up, they gave their treasure. When you give to God, you give him your time, you give him your talent, you give him your treasure, and all of us have some of that to give, don't we? You say, Pastor, I don't have any talent. Oh, yes, you do. It is impossible for you to be a Christian without having received a spiritual gift from Almighty God. Are you using it to honor the Lord? When you want to give to the Lord, how do you do it? You give him your time, you give him your talent, you give him your treasure. As the wise men did, you show the obedience of sacrifice. Now let's move closer to the center of this story as we move away from the wise men and let's visit for just a moment with the shepherds. And the shepherd's story is given to us in the book of Luke and the second chapter and the eighth verse. And this is what the Bible says. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known that saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. The shepherds. If you read the story of the Israelites when they came into Egypt, and remember how they came to get food and they were brought to a land and they were, they were pushed out of the center of Egyptian culture to a place where the Egyptians would never have to see them because according to the text, they were shepherds and the Egyptians despised shepherds. It continues to fascinate me at this season of the year that out of all of Israel, God chose to reveal himself through his son First of all, to the lowest of the lowest in the culture of that day. Why do you suppose he did that? I have no doubt in my mind that first and foremost it was done to communicate to us that no one is outside of the reach of a loving God. That he will touch us no matter where we are or what we've done or how low we may feel about ourselves. He came for us all. He didn't just reach down to the upper crust of society. He reached all the way down to the shepherds. The shepherds teach us what we already are in the process of learning, and that is that worshiping Christ is impossible without serving him. They offer to us the picture of the obedience of service. And now we get even closer to the center of the story as we visit the narrative concerning Joseph, once again back in Matthew chapter 1, where we read these words, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. As his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. 
and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Joseph, we are told, was the son of Jacob. Joseph was God's choice to act as an earthly father to Jesus Christ. Joseph was not the father of Jesus, for the Lord Jesus had no earthly father. He was born to Mary of the Holy Spirit in the miraculous birth of the Son of God. But Almighty God knew that Jesus would need an earthly father to care for him in the early days of his life. And according to Matthew's genealogy, Joseph was chosen, and Joseph was a royal person, a potential king, and yet we know very little about him. He is the most mysterious, perhaps, of all the players of the Christmas story. In fact, I have a book in my library called The Forgotten Man of Christmas, and it's about Joseph. He appears on the scene for only a moment, and then he disappears. In fact, the only other time he is mentioned is when 12-year-old Jesus was inadvertently left in Jerusalem, and we read about Joseph there. After that moment, Joseph isn't mentioned again in the narrative of the New Testament. Yet this one thing we do know, while we know very little about him, we know when we meet Joseph that Joseph is in the midst of a crisis. In fact, it is one of the most unique crises in the story of humanity. He is called upon to marry a pregnant virgin, to bear the scorn and absorb the burdens of raising the man of sorrows. Several years ago, Max Licato and some other friends of mine wrote a little book about Christmas in which we inserted some of our favorite Christmas sermons. And in his typical freshness, Max described Joseph as being caught between what God says and what makes sense. Have you ever been caught there? caught between what God says and what makes sense. What God said to Joseph made no sense. And yet Joseph was caught in this crisis. He didn't know everything, but he did what he knew. He shut down his business. He picked up his family. He went to another country. Why? Because that is what God told him to do. There is no record in Matthew's account of Joseph ever speaking one word. He is the silent one of the story. But we have something more important than his words. We have the record of his deeds. Again, in verses 24 and 25, we read these words. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. The word know here is not a word about acquaintance, but it's the most intimate word to describe the relationship between a husband and wife that often is the reason why children come into this world. They had not had relationships with each other. That's what it means. And as practically hard and publicly humiliating as it might have been, Joseph silently obeyed God's instructions. Do you know anything at all about the obedience of silence? <laughs> Sometimes God says to you to do something, and you are caught between what God has said and what makes sense, and you don't even know how to respond. There have been a few occasions like that in my life when I just have to shut my mouth and do what God's told me to do. One of the greatest acts of love that you can offer to your Savior during the Christmas season is your obedience of sacrifice, as is illustrated in the wise men, your obedience of service, as is illustrated in the shepherds, perhaps even your obedience of silence, as expressed in the man Joseph. And there's one more person in this story, perhaps the most important of all, and that's the person Mary, and her record is given to us once again in Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. 
Here's what the word says. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. And, and Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? <laughs> and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren, for with God nothing is impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The last personality in the story is Mary. Mary, who is so loved and revered and respected by the church, that some parts of the church have elevated her way beyond where she should be. And sometimes in our reaction to that, we try to ignore her at this season of the year. Mark it down. Mary was a magnificent woman. But to keep it in balance, let me remind you that when she was the one through whom the Savior of the world was born, she needed the Savior just like everybody else. She was not perfect. She was chosen by God, and the Bible says she was highly favored. That means that out of all of the women of her day, God selected her to be the one through whom God would send his son into human flesh. Up until this particular day, Mary probably lived a normal life. And then in the midst of routine, a single supernatural moment shattered the normalcy of her life. I, I don't know where she was when this happened. Maybe she was kneeling, saying her prayers at night or at the beginning of the day. How frightened she was with the sudden arrival of a heavenly messenger. And the Bible says that Gabriel understood Mary's fear and, and began to comfort her and tell her she did not need to be afraid because what was about to happen through her was the most wonderful thing of all. She would have a son who would be also the son of the Most High God. And just stop for a moment and consider what happened to Mary from that moment. Thoughts of marriage turned to thoughts of motherhood. Thoughts of a quiet, ordinary life turned to the anticipation of being the center of a spectacular miracle from heaven. No wonder God had to send his angel down here to explain it to her. She would never have believed it without that kind of an intervention in her life. As she began to understand all that was to happen to her, she could have been stoned by the culture of that day because that was the punishment for what it appeared had happened in her life. Understanding all that would happen to her, listen to her words again in verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. <laughs> Let it be to me according to your word. Do you think she understood it all? Oh, I don't. No more than did Joseph. But she knew it was the voice of the Lord speaking to her through the angel that was sent, and that was enough. Do you see the thread that runs through all four of these narratives? The wise men obeyed and brought their gifts. Theirs was an obedience of sacrifice. The shepherds obeyed, and having come to the manger, they left praising and glorifying God. Theirs was the obedience of service. Joseph quietly accepted the incredible story of Mary's pregnancy and did what he was asked to do. His was the obedience of silence. And Mary said, be it unto me according to your word. Hers was the obedience of submission. And may I suggest to you that in this Christmas season, when we're prone to give gifts to everyone but to the Lord himself, the best gift we could ever give to him as followers of Christ would be to offer up to him our obedience.
to whatever it is he has told us to do. Maybe some of you here today are struggling with something God has asked you to do. Maybe you feel caught between what God has said and what makes sense. But if you know it is from God, if it is in coincidence with his word, why not just give it up to him? I can tell you from experience that usually the hardest things we give up to God are tests of our willingness to obey him so that then God can trust us with something greater than we could ever have imagined had he not prepared us properly for it. You will never be a debtor to Almighty God. You will never give to him obedience and look back and say, I wish I had never done that. But when you offer yourself up to God, as did the people in the first Christmas, you will discover the glory of the Lord beginning to descend upon your life, and Christmas will take on a whole new meaning. As we know all too well, it is possible to experience Christmas in most of the cultures of the world without ever experiencing Jesus Christ. But I hope that has not been your experience this year. If you have enjoyed the parties and exchanged the gifts, but haven't experienced Jesus Christ personally, I hope you will ask him to become your savior and Lord today.